there, let me get my sweater on. And I think we're going to go into Romans chapter 9. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. But I have a question first. Sure. Uh, there's an older member, you know, who knows everything about the Bible and this and that. And Probably memorized the catechism, knows all the hymns, yes. is able to lead in the prayers. Yes. And, okay. And then it. a newer member came in and is all excited and kind of took over on some things. Ooh, got so excited that they were exuberant and maybe the older member felt pushed to the side. Yes. Yeah. I bet the older member even started to question or to say stuff like, this isn't fair, you know, that you need to go through all the ropes. Mm -hmm. We all feel that way at different times. That happens to all of us. It happened to Paul, too. And in fact, it's what Romans 9 is about. So I think I think we could start to hear, although Romans 9 is just tricky enough, um, that maybe we should hear it in the message translation, which makes it just a little uh, more flowing in terms of the way we hear it. So let's hear let's hear verses one through about oh, one through five. At the same time, you need to know that I carry with me at all times a huge sorrow. It is enormous deep pain, deep within me, and I'm never free of it. I'm not exaggerating. Christ and the Holy Spirit are my witness. It's the Israelites. If there were any way I could be cursed by the Messiah so that they could be blessed by him, I'd do it in a minute. They're like my family. I grew up with them. They had everything going for them. Family, glory, covenants, relations worship, promises, to say nothing of being the race that produced the Messiah, the Christ, who is God over everything, always. Oh, yes. Well, Paul sounds, at this point, like he is really, um, he, he's really in a deep pain about his own, his own family, the Israelites, not quite understanding what Jesus is about. And in fact, maybe even being a little bit irritated by these young upstart, we call them Gentiles, you know, the other. Uh, because the Gentiles were supposed to be... Um, separated. Separated, yeah. And remember, Paul spent a lot of time in his arguments saying that God's love wants to come to both. both. Okay, I'll put this one up. We got it in there. So let's hear, let's hear what Paul has to continue to say. Uh, in fact, if we hear way down at verse 14. Is that grounds for complaining that God is unfair? And not so fast, please. God told Moses, I'm in charge of mercy. I'm in charge of compassion. Compassion doesn't originate in our bleeding hearts or our moral sweat, but in God's mercy. The same point was made by God when God said to Pharaoh, I picked you as a bit player in this drama of my salvation power. All we're saying is that God has to be the first word, or that God has the first word, initiating the action in which we play our part for good or ill. Now, Paul has just gone through a whole series of things talking about the fairness of God, and he, he actually uses the... Israelites, the older brothers, own uh, own sense of their story. Remember that what would what should be fair is the oldest or the firstborn should receive everything. But he went through the story of Rebecca. That was the that was the uh, uh, daughter-in-law of uh, the daughter-in-law of Abraham. That uh, when their kids Jacob and Esau were born. Jacob, the younger, got the blessing, and Esau didn't. It's not fair, is what people should say. But then Paul goes into an argument. It wasn't fair that God would say to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, I desire to take these people out of Egypt. God, God decides he's going to allow his fairness, his mercy, to operate in a certain way. Well, I think we could ask a question, you know, um, is that the way God really wants to work? Well, let's hear verses uh, 20 and continue on. Who in the world do you think you are to second-guess God? 
Do you for one moment suppose that any of us knows enough to call God into question? Clay doesn't talk back to the fingers that mold it, saying, Why did you shape me like this? Isn't it obvious that a potter has the perfect right to shape one lump of clay into a vase holding flowers and another into a pot for cooking beans? If God needs one style of pottery, especially designed to show his angry displeasure, and another style carefully crafted to show his righteous, glorious goodness, isn't that all right? Either or both happens to the Jews, but it also happens to other people. Hosea put it well, I'll call nobody and make them nobodies. I'll call unloved and make them beloved. In the place where they yelled out, you're nobody, they're calling you God's living children. Okay, so here's Hosea talking to Jewish people in the voice of God. I have the right to call nobodies and make them into somebodies. I have the right to call those who are unloved and make them loved. I'm doing that with you. Now Paul is using these words with his Jewish brothers and sisters, the Israelites, and saying, I have the right to reach out to the nations. I have the right to take people who are nobodies and make them somebodies. I have the right to, to let them come into the, come into the family home. Uh, and in fact, now you're left with kind of a story of what are you going to do about it? How do you handle this? So we hear the very end of chapter 9, I, as Paul continues. How can we sum this up? All those people who didn't seem interested in what God was doing actually embraced what God was doing as he straightened out their lives. And Israel, who seemed so interested in reading and talking about what God was doing, missed it. How could they miss it? Because instead of trusting God, they took over. They were absorbed in what they themselves were doing. They were so absorbed in their God projects that they didn't notice God right in front of them, like a huge rock in the middle of the road. And so they stumbled into him and went sprawling. Isaiah, again, gives us a metaphor for pulling this together. Careful, I put a huge stone on the road to Mount Zion, a stone that you can't get around, but the stone is me. If you're looking for me, You'll find me on the way, not in the way. So here is, here is Paul saying uh, Israel was so interested in just doing all of its work and making sure that it was done right that maybe it missed how God works, that God isn't looking for how we prove ourselves right. God's interested in showing mercy to some who are unloved and that God, in fact, wants people not to earn but to have a gift of how this works. I think we have to constantly learn that. I think so. Mm -hmm. Learn how to receive it. Learn how to receive it, yeah. You know, that kind of reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. Ah, that's insightful. Okay, because it's not just the story of the prodigal son. That's in Luke chapter 15. It's not just the story of that one son. Remember, he runs away and even begins eating with pigs later on. It must have smelled pretty bad, you know. But it's also the story of another son. Mm -hmm. And the other son, what was he doing? Do you remember? He was at home working and... Being diligent, okay? Well, kind of like our older church member. He was doing everything right. You know, he was doing everything, everything righteously. But when the son came home, what did he do? He went and pouted in the field. <laughs> <laughs> do you know how to pout? I do. <laughs> he went out and pouted. And what we would expect is dad would come out and just say, get your butt in here. But that's not what he did, did no. he? Do you remember what he did? He went out and talked to the son. He talked to the son and he said, are you jealous of your brother? Have you thought that you, you had to earn everything in my family? It was a gift. You know, I think Paul may have been using that story with his own with with his own background. And not trying to to bash the people of Israel and say you missed out, but trying to say you're gonna stumble over this. 
It isn't about earning. It's about receiving it as a gift. As a gift. It's always mercy. Maybe it didn't just happen for ancient Israel. Maybe it still happens in the church. I think so. I think it happens with me, too, because sometimes I see there's some out there that I think they're never going to get it, and then God surprises me, and he lets me know he's continuing to make nobodies into somebodies, mm -hmm. and those who feel that they're unloved be loved. Rather than be jealous and off to the side, we realize that's what this story is about in the first place. Well, Kate, let's go ahead and put this up. And I think you've done a good job of understanding uh, understanding chapter 9 as we say, see you later, neighbor. See you later.